And essentially the rule is like this. You don't wear anything that isn't actually keeping you alive. I'm actually very in awe of ancient technology and what people could achieve. It's such a clever, simple design. became very decorative because it was simply a costume and you displayed your wealth by the quality of your armor. You and I are soft-skinned animals. Our ancestors, whether hunting dangerous prey or fighting amongst themselves, learnt early on that it was a good idea to have some sort of protection over their bodies. The furs and skins of animals, as well as providing warmth, also gave a good deal of protection against claw, tooth and weapon. But when tribal conflict turned into organised warfare, even greater protection was required. The age of armour had dawned. And ever since then, the armourer has been trying to do the impossible, to provide an effective defence against a variety of deadly weapons, and to make that protection light and flexible enough to allow the man within to move, fight, and if necessary, run away. There have been many answers to the problem. Metal armour, whether made of solid plates or interlinking rings of wire, has been one of the most long-lasting of them. But why have mail and plate proved so effective and so endearing? There are essentially two strategies in armour. You either deflect things, such as swords, spears, arrows, crossbow bolts, bullets, or you absorb their impact. Most of them had no defences whatsoever. A fair proportion had fabric defences, garments called jacks, that is to say, quilted doublets. These garments are so fragile and, of course, almost valueless at the time, and so they simply haven't survived. In addition to the quilted defence that was being worn in the 15th century, these garments have little squares of iron fitted into the quilting, so they're not visible in a complete garment in good condition. But looking at this example, which looks as if it's almost completely destroyed, you can see the construction, that the plates are clearly visible, the cords holding the plates into the quilting are clearly visible. The 
problem is with the Jack that we really don't know how good a defence it was. It's quite clear from ballistic testing that it's not as good in a kind of laboratory environment as uh, the highest quality Augsburg armour of plate. But in general, it was probably quite useful for keeping not particularly fierce blows or particularly powerful missiles from injuring the troops wearing them. This is a fragment of a 16th century brigandine. It's made of small rectangular iron plates riveted inside a fabric coat covered with velvet. So all you see on the outside is a velvet coat with gilt rivets on it. Well, the nice thing about this form of defense is it's actually incredibly simple to make you need to chop up a lot of little rectangular pieces of iron and you need to rivet them inside a coat. But those are fairly low-level skills. Armour is always a compromise between protection and inconvenience, preventing people moving weight that they need to carry around on the battlefield. And essentially the rule is like this. You don't wear anything that isn't actually keeping you alive. And there are wonderful records in the 16th century of troops being equipped in Flanders with enormously expensive equipment. And as soon as they get out of um, sight of the person who bought all the stuff, they're, they're throwing the armed defences in the ditch because they don't want to wear it. It's not actually helping them on the battlefield. The idea behind mail seems to be Celtic, and <clears throat> some of the earliest finds of mail come from archaeological sites uh, in Britain, in fact. It seems to have been adopted by the Romans and to have spread east around the Mediterranean and into Asia. And the type of mail that we see here in this very late 15th century example is actually remarkably similar to the type of mail that was being produced by the Celts and the Romans. Well, it's an extraordinary thing. Here's a type of armour made entirely of holes that's the principal type of defence used in European warfare for over 1,500 years. The reason it's amazing is, on one level, it's such a clever, simple design. You're using very small pieces of metal, and you interlink them, and you'll get a very, very flexible armour. To begin making mail, you need wire first. There's a lot of controversy about when people started making wire. Once you've got the wire, the next thing you need to do is coil it into little springs. Uh, I use a hand mandrel for coiling the wire.
the next process along is to cut them off so you start to produce the individual links. What people did think was that this was punched out of a sheet but it's um, a lot more complicated than people think. The next step is to overlap each link you have to soften the rings between each process otherwise it makes the operation of punching and riveting much more difficult and more liable to go wrong. You need to uh, widen the area which is overlapped so you can make enough room to punch a hole through it because all the mail is riveted up at the end. So you've made the overlapped area wider by squashing it between a pair of pliers. The next thing you need to do is punch the hole and use a small punch to do that. It's called drifting. It's a technical term for it. I'm actually very in awe of ancient technology and what people could achieve. Once you've got the link with a hole in it, you can then start constructing the shirt. The male does vary in size, and some of it's incredibly small. And obviously, um, this makes the rivets very, very small. They're, un they're, say, two millimetres wide at the top. It makes the whole process quite well, extremely fiddly, to be honest. The final step is to cut the rivet, put it in the hole and then close it between pliers and that's the finished riveted shirt. If you're making an armour out of plates, it's incredibly difficult to cover areas like the armpits which move around a lot. And so really what they're making is a flexible metal cloth, and that's the brilliant thing about it. Nail was actually useless uh, on its own. You've got to wear something underneath it for it to take effect. Uh, there are wonderful records of Spaniards uh, out in the conquest of the New World um, <clears throat> poking fun at the uh, locals' obsidian-tipped arrows. So they said, well, they're not bad. They're, they're very good weapons, we find, anyway. And so they hung up some male shirts on their own, and they were able to shoot um, obsidian-tipped arrows straight through them. Now, if they were padded and on a human body, that simply wouldn't occur. Um, male has to be worn with some kind of padding, usually a quilted defence underneath.
Japanese armour looks rather decorative, but in practice, it's designed to give freedom of movement. My European armors weigh 85 pounds, this weighs about 50 pounds. So it's really heaven by comparison to anything uh, uh, that I tend to wear at any other time of the day. The most difficult uh, part of it is actually the helm, uh, because the helm, as you can see, is very clumsy and it, and it has the elaborate crests on the top. So it's clumsier in some ways, um, but again, it wasn't made to do the same job as European armour, so there's a lot more freedom in that sense. It moves with you far more than, than a European armour does. Uh, I'm not sure I trust it to protect me in quite the same way, but it is a different philosophy. Like all Asiatic armours, it is in fact made of lamella, of iron and rawhide, laced together with silk braid. And together this combination absorbs the energy of an impact or a cut before actually penetration can take place. This kind of defence has kind of internal springs, so that anything that hits it doesn't exactly bounce off, but the kinetic energy of the impact is absorbed by all these springy materials. Armour's always designed for a particular purpose. This type of armour is designed for wear on a horse against the threat of archery. And of course the principal weapon throughout Asia for most of that period was the, the composite bow. It's a matter of what's most useful on the day at the time against the weapons which are around on the battlefield. When you are dressing in Japanese armour, it's normal, as in European armour, to start from the feet first and work your way up to the helmet. But in conditions of war or in emergency, there are methods of getting into the armour very quickly. One of the simplest being to hang it up by a rope and dive up from underneath it and emerging through the armour holes. It's probably effective as solid plate armour but in a totally different kind of way. It, it resembles in fact some of the modern lamellar armours used in things like bulletproof vests and for armour on tanks. During Japan's early history, armour was very much the prerogative of the rich, although their retainers wore a very simpler kind of armour. But during the 16th century, during the prolonged and very vicious civil wars, all classes of fighting men wore armour, from the very rich to the very poorest peasants who were recruited as matchlock men.
During the later period of peace, which continued until the 1850s, 1860s, um, once again, armour became very decorative because it was simply a costume. And you displayed your wealth by the quality of your armour. Japanese armour was originally devised for use by mounted horsemen and such features as the large shoulder guards which replaced shields are one of its characteristic features. Although the helmet and mask look rather grotesque to us. One of the main functions of the mask was to simply act as an attachment point for the helmet cords, which if you tied it under your chin tended to loosen, but if you tie it onto the mask, it allows you to tie it very tightly to your face. The helmets on Japanese armor look peculiar to our eyes. But again, they were devised initially for use by mounted archers. And the turnbacks at the edges of the neck guard originally acted to protect the face from arrows coming from the opposition. Armour was intended to protect vulnerable spots, and a warrior's head was his most vulnerable target. The front of the skull is relatively tough, but a blow just above the jawbone can break the skull even if it's delivered by a strong child with a big stick. So helmets have always been important. Many of them have been intended not merely to protect the skull, but also to offer protection to the face, where a blow can so easily blind and also to do something about the veins and arteries of the neck. The essential feature of a good quality medieval or Renaissance helmet is that the skull was made from one single piece of metal. Nowadays, the standard technique is to weld the helmet in two halves. If it's well done, you can't tell the difference, but it's not right. The real art we have to preserve is to form these things as they were made in medieval times from the single sheet. There's no other way to do it. You just... You simply can't get the medieval feel if you use 20th century techniques. It doesn't work. They neither feel right nor look right. What you have here is an authentic medieval product. The medieval craftsmen were very extremely clever, skilled people. If they had written down what they knew, 
then life would be a lot simpler nowadays, but they didn't. It was a, a fairly closely guarded secret. You have to relearn the whole series of medieval techniques, but the art of shaping a, a single plate into a piece of armour, which after all is a, a work of art and a, a working machine at the same time, that is very difficult. You just have to work it out for yourself. The battlefield at Taunton dates from the War of the Roses, which is a 15th century battle. It was fought on Palm Sunday in 1461, where apparently between 50,000 and 100,000 troops met on the hills surrounding us here. And the engagement is supposed to have lasted between six and 10 hours. In that time, there were supposed to be 28,000 people killed. Now, how accurate that is, it's difficult to judge. But one thing we can assume is that there are a vast number of people buried in this landscape. We're looking for mass graves, which can hopefully tell us more about the battlefield itself. So far there is very limited evidence. There is historic documents from the period, but they are very limited in number and what they actually tell us about the battle is very limited as well. The most interesting find was the number of cranial injuries that the victims had sustained. We'd thought previously that soldiers wore helmets at this period, and so we were quite surprised that these ones obviously weren't wearing helmets. Many of them had been sustained to the back of the head. Some of them were healed, which means they must have been sustained in previous battles. The importance of this find is it's the first time we've had the opportunity to investigate the casualties of a British battle. We're using in a number of new techniques within this area to locate mass graves and the area of the battlefield itself. All of these techniques are non-invasive. They will not disturb the ground at all, apart from the fact that we're walking over it in a logical manner, mapping every metre. When we excavated the graves, most of the skulls were in a fragmentary condition and they probably would have been broken to pieces before they were laid in the ground and it was only in the laboratory that we managed to piece them back together again.
We know they were using sharp weapons like swords and daggers, and those injuries are quite different from the blunt type of injuries inflicted by something like the spike of a poleaxe. Some of them had been hit in the face, not only once, but on repeated occasions. And to stand opposite someone and inflict those kind of injuries suggests very brutal warfare, as opposed to the kind of chivalrous idea we've had in the past of knights with lances jousting in conflicts. For quite a long time, soldiers wore nothing particularly solid by way of headgear. They went to war in 1914, by and large, wearing caps or shakos. But the casualties in the first year of the war meant that the helmet was reinvented. And it followed a peculiarly national line. The British wore a rimmed helmet, the battle bowler as it was nicknamed, which looked rather like the kettle hat of medieval times. The Germans wore something like this, which looked almost like a medieval salad worn 450 years before the First World War. Well, the protective qualities of the armour uh, depend largely on an attack coming from the front. So, if I close myself off, you can see there are relatively few targets. Uh, the trouble being that if you open your arms out or lift your arms up into the air, then the areas which are covered by mail become vulnerable.
This one, I think, is uh, about £70, plus the mail on the top of that, so all this mail adds more weight. Uh, with regard to hot, how hot is it? Uh, the thing is with the armour, there's nowhere for the hot air to go. So it, the hot air in, underneath the armour tends to build up and build up and build up, so you get a sort of a sauna effect in that the hot air then heats you up, you heat up the air. But it, the, the jacket underneath is designed to absorb all that sort of uh, the moisture that comes off of your body. So that in turn acts something like a wetsuit, so it keeps you quite cool in actual fact. So once the jacket has become wet, that moisture keeps you fairly cool. want to go into a combat situation wearing armour that you felt was so restrictive that you wouldn't be able to defend yourself. And indeed the medieval knight would have his armour tailor-made for him, which could be a very expensive business of course. Armour makes good sense, at least in theory, for it helps protect its wearer from death and injury. But often it became too heavy or too expensive, like plate armour, or simply failed to give protection against all the risks on the battlefield. There was a constant duel between the armourer and those who were attacking armour. As missiles got better and bullets flew faster, so armour got more heavy and became more difficult to wear. But as soon as armour seems finished, it creeps back in again. Plate defences were only ever one of the options available to the armourer, and even in its decline, armour never went completely out of use. So today, especially now that we increasingly rely upon smaller numbers of more highly trained people to defend us, whether they be in the army or the police. Most of those are usually equipped both with helmets and body armour. The wheel has come full circle. <laughs>